Welcome, everybody. Thank you for staying for the last session of the conference. Uh, for the last many years, I've worked as an autism consultant for Pike Township Schools, which is a large urban school district on the northwest corner of Indianapolis. Um, I'm also a speech language pathologist. At Pike, I was a member of the uh, district behavior support team, which does exactly what you would expect. Uh, when a building has exhausted all of their resources for addressing and interfering behavior in a student's learning, they call in a district team where we would continue with the FBA, the Functional Behavior Assessment, and look and see if we could find new triggers, new information. So I assume that that's a world that many of you are involved in. We're going to be talking about how some of these sensory issues can be triggers for behaviors that can be addressed before the behavior occurs. So that's going to be one of our pushes today. Yeah. Glad you guys are here. Thanks for coming. Um, was anybody in any of our other sessions? OK, good to know. Um, welcome back. Uh, I'm Cheryl Boucher. I'm an occupational therapist. I am, am an MSD of Wayne Township Schools, a very large urban school corporation here in Indianapolis. Um, so we're excited you are here. Um, it's been a great conference. It's been fun to be part of it. Um, we are going to try to cover a lot of information. We, we say we always run out because we plan more than we can possibly get through, but we want you to have some handouts and so forth as well. When we look at sensory, there's lots of sensory systems. There's lots of things to understand about sensory before you just cut to strategies, but we try to pair each sensory area with the strategies so you're not waiting for strategies at the very end. I don't like workshops like that. Uh, we want you to get this as much as you can in an hour and 15. Um, and so with no more, we'll get well, going. I, uh, I just wanted to ask a couple yep. of things. Cheryl and I do a full day training on sensory strategies. So we're going to, as Cheryl said, we will not get to many of the slides that are on your handout. This particular slide, uh, this particular presentation is based on secondary strategies. For those of you who work at the middle school and the high schools. so. When we finish, just know that there are many more strategies on the flash drive that you can pull up. If you want to contact, contact us and uh, ask any questions, Cheryl and I have a website that's IHateToWrite.com. That's our book. You may have seen it down on the table. All right. Um, or you can email each of us. I'm at Kathy at I Hate to Write, and she's at Cheryl at I Hate to Write. We also have a Facebook page. Guess what it's called? Yes. I hate to write. Right. We're so clever. Uh -huh. It takes two yeah. of our brains to do that one. But we often put strategies that you can can use and take back into your classrooms on that strategy. We also have a Twitter feed that's not under I hate to write. It's under my name, Kathy Oler. So I'll be putting some things uh, about this conference on that too. So anyway, if you have questions or comments after this, feel free to contact us. We would love to hear from you. Okay. Okay. With no further yeah. ado. And how many of you are special education teachers? Great. Gen ed teachers? Awesome. Administrators? Yay. Any um, SLPs? Any OTs? Psychs? Uh, counselors? Parents of somebody who, who just love and adore and may also have some sensory needs? Okay. How many of you work primarily with uh, students at the middle school? Middle school level. Okay. High school level? Combination of both? Okay. All right. Thank you. My, my daughter, um, who's just amazing um, as a young adult, had um, been diagnosed. We went ahead and had her diagnosed, and she was found to have ADHD when she was going into high school. Grades started to decrease, and I started to see there's something going on. I've tried so, as many holistic things as I can under a general education plan. We have to be able to get into college. Um, and so we, anyway, long story short of it, but the point of the story was that I never forget her. She used to always just throw herself down when she was upset. She'd just throw herself down on the ground and give herself this nice big bang on the floor. Like it just felt good to her body. It was calming. She was grounded and she would cry if she was upset. 
And she goes, Mom, I'm going away to college. What am I going to do? I can't throw myself on the floor anymore. They're not going to think I'm very cool. I said, I think we need some new strategies, honey. So no matter how old you get, sometimes we still need sensory supports. We just got to figure out the cool way to give them. And so many um, young adults and older adults say that their autism is not what impacts them the most. It is their sensory processing difficulties that are the most detriment that they experience every day. We've had individuals who said they could not get out of their shower in the morning without using one of those really hard UFA sponges all over their body. I'm talking the real hard coarse things to provide deep pressure touch to their brain and body just to feel calm and organized and ready to start the day. And that sounds so very odd to many of us, doesn't it? It's just fascinating. Sensory is an area that um, an hour and 15 is it, we can't give it justice, but we're going to do as much as we can here. So uh, I, I want you to think about in your middle schools and high schools what you're doing for all kids first. Think about what's good for universal design. So I know that no matter what a diagnosis is or not a diagnosis, I don't even have to need a diagnosis. If you can tell children who need and have challenges with self-regulation. Um, but I'm looking at all of these little subcategories including our neurotypical kiddos. Everybody needs good sensory input. You do it to yourselves all day long and you just don't know that you're doing it, right? So if I see someone get up and stand in the back of the room, I know, whoa, you're falling asleep or you need to stretch, you're uncomfortable in the chair, maybe you're cold, you're doing something to meet a sensory need. And then I wanna know that I want all my kids to understand that they all can benefit from figuring out what they need. What is it as far as seating, the lighting in a room, the noises, the movement, calming, waking up, writing tools, what it is that works for me. And then as I get older and get out of high school and I go on to college or whatever my next steps are, I know as a self-advocate what is going to be purposeful for me, what really helps me, what keeps me sensory regulated so I can be the best I can be. So when I look at classroom strategies as a whole, I'm going to look at things that are aerobic. I want big muscle movement. I want structured movement. I want calming. I want alerting. I want organizing. Let me back up for just a minute. Aerobic, I want target heart rate. I want to get that heart rate up. The research, we probably won't get to the slides that are included. Maybe we will. The research is abundant on what aerobic exercise does. The research is abundant on what exercise does for individuals with autism. And so there's lots and lots of good things happening, but we've got to make sure we take the time to do it somehow within your school day and at home. Big muscle work we'll talk about. I want that child to also feel calm inside, but I also want to start, after I've got that good movement going, I want to be organized inside, internally organized, and how I can help that child with that, and to be calm and ready to be the best I can be, whether it's athletic, whether it's academic, whether it's just being able to have, being part of a group to work on a team problem together. So think about yourself. Like I said, you've done it all day long. Like everybody was, yay, cookie time, right? Brownie, something oral, it's chewy, I'm awake again, it tastes amazing. Um, what do I need to do to get myself awake and alert at long meetings during conferences? I was so fired up when we walk in the door. And so two days of conferences and then by the last session, I'm going, whew, I'm getting tired. And uh, so I have to find a way to get up and move, and I'll probably have you guys move more for my benefit in a bit. So these are all the things that I might pick. You don't need me to read all of them. But things that you find that work for you, so we all have things that somebody, like Kathy and I talked about one day, I said, oh my gosh, it was awesome that I got up early, um, not that I love getting up early by any means, but I got up early and went down to the pool, we were presenting somewhere else, I did not do it this time, um, went swimming that morning, it was wonderful, and I said, isn't that so cool, and we started talking about this, and Kathy went, Ew, yeah. You went up and got in cold water, went down to go swimming, that did not sound good to Kathy, and that was okay, to me it did. You know, and vice versa. So we all have different things that meet our needs. To me, I would live in water if I could, literally. <laughs> and so, yeah. So, and when we think about a sensory lifestyle, you'll hear the terminology, um, a sensory diet. Have you heard that term before with your OTs? And what that's really saying is that you get three big meals a day throughout school day. And those big meals of sensory stuff stays in your system the longest. I'll get an hour and a half to two hours if I give really good structured movement, big muscle activities, things that require heavy work, and if I give deep pressure touch. So kind of hang on to that, I'll come back to it, but I just want you to have kind of this picture. I call it a sensory lifestyle, or I should say it was my term, I did not coin it. I like that someone else coined that, because it's across 
all environments. It's all day long. And whether you've got a backpack on literally or just know that these are the tools I need, there are things I need. Just like whether it was the brownie this afternoon, maybe it was a piece of gum. Maybe you went out and took a fast walk before you came to your next session. Maybe you sat in the front because you get too visually distracted if you're in the back. All of these things are meeting sensory needs. So little snacks, little meals, little things are like lowering the lights. Everybody either gets calm or falls asleep. So if I do that, that's a great strategy. But if I turn on the lights, I just change that sensory input, right? If I light a candle, you're all gonna, most of us would say, oh, that smells awesome. Somebody else might be very offended by it. But that will last as long as the stimulus is applied. If I give you a chewy snack, it's great. It's oral motor, I'm sucking, I'm chewing, I'm swallowing, I'm breathing. I feel pretty good. Snack's gone, I'm back to where I was. But if I start with all that good structured movement and big muscle activity, then I fill myself full of my big meals, and the other things are the icing on the cake, okay? They're good stuff, but not, don't get me wrong, I love the little snacks, but they're gonna help me to be more organized inside and help me to be more functional and purposeful every day. So this, these next few slides are just saying that we have, all of us have that ability and need to self-regulate, and I'm, it's gonna help me be more focused, more calm, more in the moment, the more I am sensory regulated. Yesterday it was hot in this room, I felt hot. And it's, if I'm hot, then all of a sudden, I'm not sensory regulated. I'm not the best that I can be. If you weren't feeling well inside, and that's that the sensory sensations of your stomach is hurting, or whatever it is, a headache, you're not going to be the best that you can be. All of these little pieces all add up to success or not success. And we all need a normal state of arousal in order to function. Again, if I turn off the lights and we, I play some calming music at this time of the day, you will literally probably fall asleep and be very relaxed. Another time I might want to use that, but that's not going to get me to that normal state of arousal. So we do it without thinking about it throughout the day. You, you provide your own, yourself your sensory needs. When I interpret this, this is just merely trying to tell you that everything has an experience, a relationship to you. And no matter, my sensory experience might be different than your sensory experience. An example is just saying that if you're home alone and watching a scary movie and someone suddenly comes up and touches you lightly on the arm, it's probably going to put you in fight flight response. You are ready to fight. You are scared. Your heart is racing. That kind of a response to it. Um, if I was smelling cookies in the oven, I may have a memory that my mom made cookies and I love the way she baked. That kind of input to me is giving me a wonderful limbic system response, olfactory goes straight to the limbic system, my emotional area, my brain, and all of a sudden I just feel really good and I've got this great memory of that sensory experience. And so I said that this morning or earlier in our last session that it used to be that when you would go get your tooth filled, you would have sulfur, was it sulfur? It smelled really bad. And the drills had a really loud noise. And so as a kid, that was my memory. That, that's what, if somebody said, get a tooth filled, oh, that sounded horrible. Now things are much better. But that's my sensory experience and my memory. And so that's what I'm going to pull up emotionally the next time this activity comes. So my point is that many of our students who struggle with sensory processing issues have their own sensory memories of experiences that they have had. And even though we're going to say, it's not going to be too loud, it's not going to be too noisy, there aren't that many people there, whatever their memory was from before is what they're going to be firing up first. Okay. It can still very, be very real to them. This is a slide just showing you all the various sensory systems from olfactory to gustatory to auditory to visual to vestibular and proprioception, our interoreceptors, and we'll be talking about all those as many as we can get to. Um, if you were in our other um, sessions, I showed this slide because it's across borders. It's a wonderful slide. You have to have good sensory integration, good sensory processing down here in order to get to the top of the pyramid. They say about 70% of our behavior is based on how we process sensory information. Again, the examples of being cold, hungry, tired, all those pieces. So if 70% of my behavior is how good I am on integrating my sensory information, that's, that's, that's a lot. And so in order to get to everything else going on, I've got to be able to make sure I've given that child, that student, enough sensory input for, for them to learn what strategies work for them in order to get to the top of the pyramid for academic learning. Um, and this is a slide showing that it's like a big traffic jam on 465. All the sensory information goes in from our outer senses as well as our inner senses. And it tries to make the right connections. And when we have good sensory processing, that happens pretty regularly. 
All the information goes in. I make an adaptive response outwardly to my environment and respond appropriately. When you guys came in the room today, you found your seat, found a chair, you navigated, you were able to get your body down into your chair without falling over. You put your purse, if you were a female, on the floor, your bags, without you toppling onto the chair. You didn't pound it down onto the floor. You spoke in a voice that was appropriate. You modulated your voice and had conversations with people. All of that was good sensory processing, all right? But if you're stuck on 465 in a big traffic jam and everything has gone in, but your body and brain are not making any sense of that information, then you're gonna have a faulty response to the environment that you're in, okay? This is just letting us know how all the areas that sensory processing, when it is challenging, impacts individuals and how it's gonna impact my learning, my behavior, my social and emotional relationships, my ability to emotionally regulate. Um, and it is estimated about five to 15% of the general population. I have kids who have no other diagnostic, but they have sensory processing disorder. So it can go very much paired with other diagnostics. Um, it is part of an evaluation now for autism. So we as OTs, we're very excited to see that. Um, it's thought that at this point, I believe it's eight and 10 of individuals on the spectrum are thought to have some kind of challenges sensory-wise. I wanted to say something about this. There is a chance that you in your classroom will get a student who has an official diagnosis of sensory processing disorder. But the chance is pretty small. Is there anyone in here that has ever had a student come to them with an official diagnosis of sensory processing disorder? My son has one. Okay, so one, maybe two mm -hmm. in this room. Mm -hmm. But I can guarantee you that every single person in this room has had students who have very significant challenges with sensory processing. It's hard to, you don't diagnose. As teachers, we look at the behaviors and we have to play detective. Look at those behaviors and how those behaviors are impacting learning, and that's what we address. Label or no label, diagnosis or no di diagnosis. Think of your students in your classroom who always seem to be tuned out or not paying attention. They may have auditory processing challenges. Think of your students in your classroom who write all over the paper, have terrible handwriting. They may have visual processing challenges. Think of your kids who, when they pass out the papers for you and walk up and down the aisles, they bump into this kid's de desk and knock this kid's books off his, his table and bump into, step on this kid's foot. You know that student. They may have challenges with proprioception. Think about your kids who are always in trouble in the cafeteria. They may actually have sensory sensitivity in the area of smell that can impact their behavior and their learning. Go figure, that one's my favorite. But anyway, before we jump to addressing the behavior, look at what may be triggering the response. And there is often a lot of clue material in their sensory, in their sensory behaviors. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay. So just some other areas that it's impacting. We covered quite a bit. This slide is just merely for you to be able to understand that it's not just sensory processing difficulties. These are the sub areas that are involved and that can be identified between um, modulation disorder, pop discrimination, sensory discrimination disorder, and sensory based motor disorder. And so and then there are sub pieces and explanations to all that. For your purposes, I don't want to spend a lot of time today on that. I just want you to be aware of that. And so we'll hit a little bit under those areas as we keep talking. Okay. So we know we have kids who are over-responsive to sensory input. We know we have students who are under-responsive. Okay. And if, I'm, if you have a question, please holler. And then we have our kids who are sensory seekers. Okay. The interesting thing is that I have, can have a student who has an over-responsiveness in one sensory system and could be under-responsive in another or could be sensory seeking. And you can kind of draw a Venn diagram of sorts and, and see some various patterns in one child. And so, you know, there's not a blood test for this. And so you have to really play detective. We try to do very good evaluations. We get profiles and information from home, as well from teachers, from, from the teachers who are with the students all the time, in addition to our evaluations. And so I don't want to just immediately plug that somebody has some sensory processing issues there. They're all over the place. That may not be the case. 
and to always pull in your students. If you're with middle school and high school students, unless you're with our, some of our students who still can have an augmented device and I hope have a voice, that some of our more challenging kids, talk to your students and have conversations about things. About I noticed that you seem to be pacing in the back of the room a lot during my lecture and during and math. You know, what's up? I don't know if any of you are familiar with Dr. Ross Green's work, but I love that it's a relationship of problem solving with the, the student, with the child. And so sometimes we all decide, and even as an OT, oh, it must be this, right? And then we find out, did anybody ask the kid? And nobody had really asked the kid. And so we need to start there when possible. Um, I thought there was a great story, and I could, should save it for tactile, but I'll probably forget at that point, so I'll say it now. Um, there was a student in uh, high school, and he had his hoodie on, which we're not supposed to wear in school. He happened to be a kiddo who had autism. His hoodie gave him a little bit of calming, a little, I want to say deep pressure, but it gave him warmth. There was enough heaviness to his head. It was his hoodie. He had his hands, and he was very calm. There was a paraprofessional in the media center, and she was walking behind him, and she had twice, two to three times, told him to take his hoodie off. Well, he also had some difficulty auditorily tuning in to what was important in the environment and tuning out what was not important. He didn't tune into her voice. He didn't know he, she was talking to him. She was, he wasn't even turned. By the third time of saying it, and he had, she had no response, she went over and she pulled his hoodie down off of his head. Guess what happened? Fight and flight. And it was fight. And the paraprofessional got hurt. And the student went down to juvenile hall. And it's a, you know, the story goes on that that was an example of that student has to learn he can't hit somebody. I cannot bodily harm anybody. I've got to learn strategies. But I also sadly say, did we set that student up for success? Had we trained everybody to understand and to know about that student? And in and of itself, that's difficult to do sometimes. That how we could have done that differently and or did that kiddo have enough big structured movement big muscle activity and some appropriate deep pressure to his body that is what he was seeking before he was put in that environment. So I just raised questions, make you think about some of your kids, um, but that hurt when I heard that story. And I know it, it could have happened to anybody. It wasn't the paraprofessional's fault. She was just, well, I don't know that I would have pulled anybody's hoodie off. But anyway, that's besides the point. And so with their sensory motor disorders and we're looking at motor challenges, postural disorder and my postural my muscle tone is affected by good sensory processing, and my motor planning. These are the students that are those out of sync kids. They, a lot of times when there's motor planning issues, I can't keep up the pace in PE. I'm not, excuse me, I'm not the kiddo who's gonna make the basketball team. I'm really struggling with my motor planning issues. Teenagers have a hard time discriminating their own sensory <coughs> needs. You know, their whole brain is changing as they reach adolescence. So sensory reactions that they have had as a young child change as they, re as they reach adolescence. And so does their ability to moderate their sensory response. And that's where we pay the price as educators because we're helping them figure it out. It's, easier to, it's easy to respond with a behavior, with a behavioral <clears throat> response than it is with a cognitive response on what these kids may need. Let's, let's start looking at some specific sensory systems. When we were in about fourth grade, we learned that the senses were those big five, seeing, hearing, smelling, <coughs> touching, and tasting. Those are still important, and we're gonna talk about those. But if you think about Cheryl's sensory pyramid that she showed a little bit ago, remember down at the very bottom, there was the sensory, the central nervous system, our heart, our lungs, our, our breath, our digestion, all that kind of stuff. Right up above that, the base of learning were what we call the three big dogs. The tactile system, the vestibular system, and the proprioceptive system. Those are all three sensory systems, and they have the most impact on learning and behavior. We're going to talk a lot about those three, because if we recognize and address a student's needs in those three, tactile, vestibular, and proprioceptive, we have the biggest chance of making an impact on their behavior and their learning. So put that in your brain because we're going to be talking a lot about that. Touch sensitivity, the tactile system. Touch sensitivity changes as kids approach adolescence. Adolescents show exaggerated neural response to pleasant stimulation. 
duh. I mean, anybody who's ever met a teenager already knew that before the research showed that. But the thing that makes it difficult for us and for the teenagers is the change. Teenagers are responding differently. So if they had tendencies to being over-responsive to tactile stimuli, hypersensitive to touch, they're going to be more so if it feels pleasant. If they tended to have a hypo-response to touch, they're going to be more so because that, that's what feels good. Things change with adolescence. We know that touch sensitivity can be either hypo, kids can hate to be touched, or hyper, they can really crave that touching. It becomes even more so as they become teenagers. All right, why is that important? It's linked to many of the behaviors that we see in the middle school and the high school classrooms. This is not going to be a surprise to anybody in here, but it may be a new way of thinking on what's triggering some of the behaviors you see. Touch sensitivity may be linked to irritation or withdrawal or anxiety when a kid enters a classroom. Anybody have an idea why that might be the case? I'll tell you in a minute, but anybody have an idea that comes to mind? What are they doing right before they come into the classroom? They're walking in the hall. What's it like in a high school or middle school hallway? Yeah, it's loud, it's a zoo, it's crazy. I'm just saying the words that I hear. People are bumping into each other, right? It's loud, there's a lot of noise, there's just a ton of sensory input. So when kids with tactile sensitivity enter a classroom, they have been bombarded with sensory stimuli that is aversive to them. Their body is in a state of alert when they come in, but not the good kind of alert, not the good kind of alert that's going to help them learn in the classroom. They're right there at that amygdala filter of fight or flight. And what you may see in your classroom is irritability, anxiety, or withdrawal. And what that means for you is at that point they're not going to be learning. Their neural impulses are not going forward to this part of the brain to the prefrontal cortex where all of our executive function learning takes place. Prioritizing, problem solving, higher level thinking, it's not going to get there because they've been bumped in the hall. Okay, that's way simplified. But that is a definite factor with a lot of kids. Poor attention to task when entering the classroom. Difficulty focusing on their, wor their work in that first five, ten minutes when they enter the classroom. Think about that. Think about your students that may show that irritability right at the beginning of class. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. Touch sensitivity can also play a role in academic challenges, learning difficulties. A hovering teacher can actually shut down learning. If you have a student who's hypersensitive to touch and you stand there like this, is that student going to be at their maximum benefit for learning? No, they're going to be so hyper aware of the fact that you're hovering over them, that their brain is shut down for the academic task. Social challenges. Think of group projects. Here in Indiana, our Indiana state academic standards require us to do group projects all the time from, well, from first grade on, quite frankly, but a lot in middle school and high school, right? You have to do group activities. Students who have touch sensitivity or an overreaction or a hyperreaction to touch may shut down during that activity because there is always going to be the kid who leans across the, uh, the one in the middle to talk to this one over here. They're going to be touched. You may have to be very sensitive to the way you set up your academic groups for group projects to maximize the learning of the student that may have a hypersensitivity to touch. There are other things on here. Go back and look at these later on your slide. Hypersensitivity to touch can impact academic learning and behavior. So what does it look like in the classroom? We talked before it can be sensitive to touch from the teacher or for the kid. Uh, sensitivity to temperature changes. If you have a student in your class who is always talking about it being too hot in the classroom or too cold in the classroom, that's a pretty good clue that this student may be, may be hypersensitive 
over-responsive to tactile stimuli. If you have a sentence who stop, a student who stops writing after a couple of sentences, it may be because that student is over-responsive to the tactile stimuli of just holding the pencil. You may have to alternate that task with a keyboard. What can I do about it as a teacher? Consider assigned seats with a student that you think might be tactile, tactile defensive or touch sensitive in a location where he's less likely to be touched. Don't put him in the middle of the room where the kids are going to pass him and knock into him as he's trying to read at his desk or do a test. Put him where he's not going to be bumped quite as much. That does not mean put him at the table in the back. But that means just put him in an area where the other kids aren't going to bump him as much. Explore standing options. There are lots of our schools that are going to alternative seating and creating standing desks. Anybody in here have standing options for students in your classrooms? Okay. I figured that. We're seeing it in more and more and more classrooms as research shows this, that students, many students don't do their best sitting in a chair. They need to move. They need to stand some of the time. Probably many of us, too, find that we're more efficient if we change our seating options or standing options when we're trying to accomplish a task. Um, allow the student to choose how he completes his written work, part of the time pencil paper, part of the time keyboard, especially if you think this is a student who has tactile sensitivity. And we're going to say this ad nauseum today. Make sure you include some options, some opportunities for movement in your educational time. We're going to talk about this a lot. This provides so many benefits for so many of our students, including those with over-responsivity to touch. And be creative with that first five minutes of class. If you have that student who's irritable, withdrawn, or anxious when he first comes into class, experiment with that. Try, try class discussion. See if that helps. Try bell work, quiet work, see if that works. See what works for that student. Keep your radar on that student and see if you can help him self-modulate his behavior and improve his learning when he comes into your classroom. Okay. And just some additional sensory strategies as Kathy was talking about respecting for that personal space um, and looking at what kind of clothes is comfortable for that student and if there's a reason why. You'll know which students, I think most of the time you understand which students are having some challenges and frequently there is another diagnostic going on. But if you're in doubt, to certainly have conversation with that student and they may just tell you, I like to wear these things. Um, and that may be enough or it may not be enough. I'm trying to look at what kind of gym clothing they're wearing. Some of our kids don't like loose fitting things, other ones like really tight fitting fit clothing. Um, trying to have a weighted backpack can be a very appropriate, great strategy. So when I look at saying, what do you need in your backpack so that you can put your sensory tools in there? And whether you put your set, uh, set of headphones in there. Perhaps I put a couple of my favorite books. Maybe I have a fidget object that's appropriate or cool. Um, we may not get to the oral part. I'll usually say for kiddos that are older and they have some kind of chewing needs that having a, a straw to chew on is kind of socially appropriate. It's pretty cool. Um, ice chips can't put in my backpack, but ice chips could be sensory, socially appropriate if I need to chew. A piece, a pack of gum. It might be some hard chewies and, or hard candies. The things that can be put in that backpack that meet my needs, but also that give me heavy work, deep pressure touch. So when I put that backpack on, I'm getting that nice, big hug feeling as I walk down the hall to school. And I know I can't carry my backpack everywhere, but boy, if I could, it would be a wonderful world for a lot of our students. So if we can make that accommodation for a student, um, I wouldn't close the door for it. I would certainly want to investigate and see if it's needed. Um, but that can be really valuable. The use of a beanbag chair, as I was talking earlier, um, of just giving big, deep pressure touch around a student's body, and even for a teenager, there are big adult beanbag chairs that can be put in a corner. Again, we talk about who's a good desk chair learner all the time versus I need some options of going to that standing desk or going over to the beanbag chair or going to a rocking chair, something that meets some of those sensory needs and removes and respects my tactile tendencies. These are a lot of, um, the top ones are a lot of more therapeutic in the sense that I say to have a therapist on board. If I was going to give somebody a big weighted vest, 
or a pressure vest or a weighted blanket for some of my more high need kids in my life school classrooms in junior high or high school. I would want an OT on board to help you decide, is that the best tool? And they've done an evaluation. And I'm going to put some kind of weighted product on a, a student. I want to make sure they really need that and it's justified and I'm on the right track. So I would want to do an evaluation and make sure on some of these bigger things. I don't need an OT to hand out a fidget or to try a set of headphones with someone or to say you need a separate place and have space in the back of the room for yourself. But when you get into some of these areas, I would want to have an occupational therapist at least to consult with um, for everything and then to be able to have more specifics for these more intense uh, accommodations and strategies. The spandex clothing is designed for deep pressure, sort of like the bicycling shorts and uh, tops and things, and they can be worn under clothing, which is kind of cool, so no one sees them. And so the student gets that deep pressure touch to their nervous system uh, by wearing the stretchy, tight clothing. Um, and for some kids, it's wonderful. And um, we had one student who had, um, I actually I think I mentioned him a little bit earlier, that he had been um, the one who liked his jeans really, really tight. He was a seventh grade student, A student. He was doing awesome. He had a diagnosis of Asperger's on the ASD umbrella. And he was a wonderful kid. They didn't have any problems with him at school. He kept it together. Well, he was keeping it together so well that when he got home, he was like a holy terror. He was a completely different kid. And, you know, someone could say, well, he's doing good at school. We're good. Uh, but no, we're going to work with the whole child and with our families, of course. And so when we sat down, we talked, and we really kind of got involved and we asked him some questions. We tried to figure out what the, the pattern was, what was the problem? Well, we found out he ate lunch really early in the day. So by the afternoon, he was already really, really hungry. He was starving. We knew he had some tactile defensiveness. He really sought out the tight, tight jeans and he didn't have any spandex clothing at the time. He was meeting his needs the way he felt he should. And so that was one of his needs happening. Um, he had another, there was something to do with homework that was a, a trigger there by the end of the day that he was trying to get it together. He was already sensory overloaded tactilely. He was hungry, and those internal receptors were giving him some messages really intense. And so by the time he got off that bus that was noisy and overwhelming to him, and the, the key was back there that he was, he was a bright kid, he was smart, and he was keeping it together. We've all done that, and then we walked in the door and went, ah, you know, I've had it for the day. I need to scream. I need to kick my shoes off. i got to talk to somebody. And that's what he was doing when he got home. So by the time we put together kind of a sensory lifestyle for him, we made sure he had a good exercise break. He went down to the nurse's station at that time. This has been a while back. And he did some weight lifting. He helped in the library during a break time. He had some jobs that were purposeful and functional for him. He had a snack in the afternoon, late in the afternoon, he was allowed to, to have because he really had to have some food. We offered some headphones to him on the, on the bus ride home, and he was accepting of them. So by the time he got into the house, he was like a different kid. It really made a change for him. And for his mom, she was home all the time, and it worked out that they went to a nearby roller skating rink. He liked to skate. So that was another big physical, big muscle movement activity that he got in his day. So it's just really trying to find, I know some of it sounds like it takes a long time, but we have a team to help with our students. So hopefully your team can come in on these tougher kids that you need a little bit more support on. And um, I think we covered all those. Um, we're gonna go on to another area, and this is our vestibular area. Vestibular, our vestibular system has an impact on lots of things. It's really, really important. It's the fluid, involves the fluid in the inner ear and the stopping and starting of movement. And so when I have movement involved, I activate that vestibular system. Um, it helps to coordinate both sides of my body working together. It has an impact on actually maintaining my muscle tone. We see some of our kids with low muscle tone, low core strength, um, and you see it all the way through school. Um, it helps me hold my head and neck up against gravity to be able to read, to write, my eyes and hands working together. Um, it has just a lot of lots of powerful stuff that it can do. It's very, very important. And many of our kids are struggling with sensory systems that vestibularly could be under-responsive or they could be over-responsive. Um, and so we'll see some things that can cause more difficulties you'll see with vestibular is lots of movement going on, 
They're more restless, they're more distractible. As we get kids in junior high and high school, you see more kiddos, if they have the cognitive ability, that they try to keep it a little more in control. You, you know, our little ones put their hands over their head, ears when it's too loud and it's really obvious. Our kids who are a little cooler and older, they kind of remove themselves from a situation or get agitated. So vestibular-wise, they keep a lot together. You might see more of a leg shaking or a little bit more pacing. Our kiddos that are more in our some of uh, life skill supports, you may see more obvious areas that they need lots of movement or very little movement. Excessive swinging, fearful of physical activity, appearing tired, unmotivated, propping their head up. I hate the words when I hear about someone who has an under-responsive vestibular system and I'll hear about a student who is just, they just look lazy, they just look unmotivated, they don't look like they're trying. No matter what, he, what I'm doing, he just doesn't seem like he even wants to give it a go. And a lot of times those kids, it's, they're struggling. They're, they are tired. They are fatigued. It takes a lot. Again, you don't think about it until you're kind of tired. To hold your head and neck up against gravity and then control my eyes and hands to move and have a school day, it's a lot of work. So many of our students do struggle with that as well. Um, so when you look at vestibular activities, and again, try to look junior high and high school, and I know we have diversity of, again, if you're working in a life skills group of children, but things that are gonna be calming when I think vestibular is gonna be slow rocking. It's gonna be slower swinging. It's gonna be the kid who you see, why does a student rock? Why is, why is that happening? Why am I swaying side to side, side to side? Have you ever had a baby in your arms, but then you didn't have the baby anymore and you find that you still kind of do that? But it feels good. It's calming, it's organizing, it's a slow-paced vestibular activity. If I'm going to alert and wake up somebody who's just about to fall asleep, I'm going to give vestibular input that is more fast-paced, more alerting, more movement, more running, more jumping, more jogging. So think about, I like to say during the day, what's, is the track free? Is the, the gym free? Is the cafeteria or cafeteria jobs available? Is, are there things going on in the library? How can I make more structured movement and big muscle activity for all of my kids or for those particular ones that really need a big boost outside of the classroom with those jobs. So these are just a nice list of those types of things. Um, there's a, anything that involves movement, you're gonna activate your vestibular system. Okay. When I think about universal design, I'm thinking about exercise breaks. And if your classroom lends itself that you can get everybody up again, kids that are older, they love competition. They like boot camp. How many, you know, how many jumping jacks can you do? How many push-ups can you do? How many sit-ups can you do? How many squats can you do? You can do activities of uh, tennis balls bouncing back and forth and repetitions on those types of things. But they're up, they're moving, everybody's got a job to do, everybody's physically active. Okay. And then just more of just identifying a pacing area in the back of the classroom. You don't have to say it's for one student. It's just, yeah, anybody get, need to get up and move? While you're trying to think, as soon as I get up and move, that connection between my vestibular system and my language center, nice little correlation goes off. I start having more spontaneous thought, more, more spontaneous language, and then it help me with my writing and reading. Um, I may find track time, running, walking, that free time that we had, one student we had in the gym during free time, they were able to go walk the track or shoot baskets. And then again, those student jobs. Look at what kind of positioning, we were talking about that earlier, Give that flexible seating plan. Ask the student where he works best. In the morning, it may be, I'm fine right here at the desk. By afternoon, I think I need a standing desk or I'm going to just be asleep. I might need to be able to sit in that rocking chair to self-regulate myself enough to keep working with you and have conversation and to be part of the group. Uh, but find what works for them. The bed risers that they give at, during college days, um, when they go on sale, it's a great time to get those. They work really nice to raise desks up even higher. So we might have a station of standing desks, so someone might just decide to rotate through. I might take a chair and just turn it backwards and have a seat, you know? I'm gonna you know, get a nice position here, I can lean into it and get some pressure against my stomach and abdomen, and it just is a nice change. I'm not gonna stay there long, but it might wake me up a little bit more than when I was sitting the opposite way. So find what works for your students. Again, have conversations, see what they want to uh, have an opinion of, I'm sure they do. I think mentioned briefly, this is the evidence-based practice for individuals on the spectrum, that exercise is an evidence-based practice. So if we can teach our young teenagers and older students as well that this, this works, and if they have a, even if they don't have a form of autism, it works for everyone. And I'll show you a couple more slides 
uh, proving that point too. But looking at the studies, they were really intense. That so they did 20 minutes in the morning, they did 20 minutes in the afternoon, and then every hour they had like a quick deep breathing yoga activity. And during those, there were physical activities going on. There was weight, there was that heavy work, there was that resistance, and good movement. What they found was so awesome is that negative behaviors went down, good behaviors, positive behaviors, learning, memory, all went up. So that, that was so exciting as an OT, I can't tell you. Because it was all the things we were advocating that we knew worked anyway, and now we had all this wonderful evidence-based um, information and studies being done. Okay. And this is just some more information. I shared earlier about um, on our other session with Coach Dave. If you have some really kiddos on the spectrum, particularly that are really challenged with their motor planning and strength and core, he has some nice little exercise things. Even if you connected a parent with him, his videos, and let them do it at home. I know you can't, not going to pull kids out and work on their exercise levels all the time. But just to be aware of it, he's, it's a, he's a great resource, just a really good guy. And then Kathy? Oh. There's just one. Okay. Yeah. We're going to talk more about this in a little bit. But the prefrontal cortex is this part, this part of the brain. This is where our higher level processing skills occur. Um, exercise, vestibular stimulation, movement sends increased blood flow to this part of the brain. This is the part that we use for learning. This part of the brain, also for prioritizing and judgment. It doesn't mature in teenagers fully until they're 19 years old. So anything we can do to increase the blood flow to that part of the brain and encourage more mature thinking is going to be a benefit right. to all of us. Okay. So what we want to talk about now is, again, looking at universal design, looking at that the research is out in abundance of what getting your heart rate up to aerobic exercise level can do for your brain. Your, and we, we know it's good for our health, but what it can do for our brain is amazing. And so it's going to affect memory, self-control, behavior, attention, arousal, decrease anxiety, increase attention and focus, decreasing learned helplessness for our kids, for our females even helping with all of the regulation of menstrual cycles and so forth, increasing self-esteem. They showed, um, there's a great videotape on Naperville, Illinois, and I think we've maybe got a slide on it, um, that they took the PE classes there. There was nobody standing around waiting for PE. Every single student had a heart monitor on, and everybody was moving the entire time in PE, continuously. And they paired that prior to um, the big academics and prior to standardized testing and regular testing. And with that in mind, they found that this is the most awesome thing ever and the test scores went up. Um, and so with that in mind, Dr. John Rady, who wrote the book Spark, he is a, a clinical psychiatrist through Harvard. He started looking at all the research. He started looking at his peers who were coming to him for support because they were runners and they had sports injuries. They could not exercise anymore and they were getting foggy. Their memory was not as good, their attention and focus. And the one piece was they had all had injuries and weren't able to jog or run anymore. So he, then he started looking at Naperville, Illinois. So I encourage you to get on that area. Um, there's another site, I'm, I'll have to think of the name of it, that has a wonderful thing with the, the woman was in a middle school, high behavioral school area. That it was a, a small pocket for the behavior children that were really challenged who could not make it in the gen ed classroom. And these students, the only thing she changed was she had uh, treadmills in the back of her classroom. Not everybody can do that, but she was able to get a hold of a couple. The kids who came in, they looked forward to coming to school. It was the only thing she did was change the increase of physical ex exercise. And all of the negatives went down, test scores, reading all went up. Um, so it was pretty phenomenal. And the Spark book is great. I encourage you to take a look at it. But he's trying to say that the mood, anxiety, attention, all of it goes down when we add the increase of aerobic exercise. He calls it miracle growth for the brain. It's like taking a little bit of Prozac and a little bit of, uh, you know, what's the other one? That, oh, a rip, like a, uh, shoot, Ritalin. That's what I'm trying to think of. Trying to take enough medications that boost all that brain that we look at trying to have attention and anxiety decrease and all these things we take our medications for and by merely increasing aerobic exercise I can get the same results for many students. Okay, go ahead and go. Um, 
this one I just want to talk about here, the behavior in the first four months, they did studies. All kids are moving 45 minutes a day. Dis discipline problems plunged by 85% in one district and 63% in another school district. Science math test, 99% took tests, and they scored number one in science and six in math. It's pretty impressive. Uh, the neat part is the area of the brain that we need to learn and have memory has a connection with our movement area of the brain, which is why it's so important. This is a composite of 20 regular neurotypically wired brains of sixth graders at rest. And this is after a 20 minute walk of the brain activity prior to them taking their math test. Scores went up. Kathy, talked a little more. Go ahead. I'm sorry. That's your slide. Yeah. No, that's okay. I get rolling. You know, we've been talking so much about vestibular. And vestibular, we've known for a long time, had to do with our sense of balance. We've known that for a long time. But it's only in the last few years that we learned the connection between that same vestibular system that orients in our inner ear and the parts of our brain that control attention, focus, and language processing. And then right along with that, we learned that what stimulates that vestibular system is movement. So you increase movement in your student's day, and you get improvement in attention, focus, and language processing. It's just, it, it's a huge benefit for the students and for us as educators. Um, this prefrontal cortex that we, were talk, that we were talking about earlier covers all of these things including movement in the day sends the blood flow rushing to that area of the brain and the neurotransmitters can operate more efficiently in that part of the brain. Um, I'm going to show you quickly a bunch of studies that have been done on this. Most of these are included in, on Dr. Rady's, Dr. John Rady's website. If you are in a position in a school to encourage movement opportunities through your students' school days, the research is your friend. I'm going to go through a few of these, and it's really, it's really beyond compelling. This first one was done in Great Britain, 19 studies, 588 kids. They did 40-minute bursts of exercise. Now, the thing that is different from a lot of our PE classes that focus on sports, all of this exercise focuses on aerobic getting the heart rate higher. That's what seems to make the impact on learning. So 40 minute bursts of exercise, it improved concentration, mental focus, and um, done 20 minutes before a test, all the test scores went up. Another study did the California test for fifth graders, seventh graders, and ninth graders. And you can see how that graph goes. As exercise increased, so did the scores. Like uh, this particular one, looked at the issue of depression in teenagers. Depression. They did a comparison study with kids taking Zoloft and kids increasing their physical exercise. Physical exercise that raises heart rate. They found that over, after four months, Zoloft and exercise resulted in the same decrease levels of depression. But after 10 months, depression was much improved, more, much more improved by the exercise than it was by the Zoloft. Isn't that amazing? That was just physical activity. This one, the Texas Cooper study, had 2,600,000 kids here in the United States. And they wanted to find out if levels of physical fitness were associated with academic performance, regardless of all of these big things that we as educators worry about. Demographics, race, ethnicity, income, school. They found not only did it hugely Im impact academic performance, but it also resulted in a higher level of attendance and fewer disciplinary incidences. Big study, two, more than two million kids. Denmark, look at this. Denmark concentration increased by 33%. Absenteeism decreased by 38% over three months. Kids improved 1.5 grade grade level improvement after three months of increasing their physical activity during their school day. It's incredible. There are a bunch more of these. This is, I think, the one that Cheryl was talking about with kids who were in an alternative school who had failed in the public <coughs> school setting because they were, they were non-learners in the public setting. They had great success in there. I'm going to skip over the rest of these. But there is so much evidence 
that including movement opportunities within a school day or within a classroom can make the time that you have left much more efficient and effective for student learning. When we look at proprioception, again, proprioceptors are housed between our tendons and ligaments that connect muscle to bone. And so think about your joints. And when I look at my jo think about my joints, I think about big joints and I've got little joints. That when I do activities that fire off push and pull and lift and carry, it fires off those proprioceptors. And when that happens, it tells me an awareness of where my body is in space. Okay, so that's, that's the strategy we're getting to. So when you look about, think about what it does for me, it's really important as an individual to function in life as well as to be successful as a student. If it's going to give me awareness of where my body is in space, where my arms are in relation to my torso, where I am in relation to an object or another human being, how, why our students are in somebody else's personal space and really invading it and talk too closely to you, a lot of times they don't have that awareness of where I am in relation to you. How do you know how high to raise your hand to catch a fly ball because you have a good sense of where your arm and body are in space without looking at it? You know, when you, again, pick up that cup of coffee, you thought it was full, but it wasn't, and you quickly make the adjustment with less force to bring the cup to your mouth. That's your sense of proprioception. So it's very, very powerful. It also is firing off these wonderful chemicals of information of just, ah, Things feel good, I feel calm, I feel organized. I'm awake and alert, but I'm not all hyped up when I add heavy movement. A lot of times I can have lots of good movement and that aerobic piece is still really vital for all that prefrontal cortex and for everything. But I can have a kiddo who's dysregulated because now they're erratic. They, they're, they're, they're moving, but they're not a calm. I've gotta provide that proprioceptive, that big muscle activity to get it all just right. So think about my postural stability, my motor planning skills we talked about. And so I may see students that are over-responsive. I may see some kids under-responsive. Some things don't feel to, a good to other kids. They don't want to run. They don't want to jump. They don't want to be involved in physical sports and activities. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, some of our kids under-responsive. It kind of feels like a shot of Novocaine. I'm just not getting good sensation to my proprioceptive system. Things are out of sync. Things just don't feel right. My poor, my, I'm more accident prone. I'm more clumsy. I'm more awkward in what I'm trying to do. <clears throat> so if I can help this child get a good big muscle activity involved throughout the day, it should stay in my system for an hour and a half to two hours if I've given enough. You may find the student who just loves helping in the, in the cafeteria and pushes and wipes up all the tables, pushes in all the chairs. Maybe at the end of the day or the beginning of the day, they take the chairs off of the library tables to get started for the day. I've got big muscle activity. We've got students pushing the big breakfast carts down the hall, and they've got a job to do before they go back in. And maybe it's just merely trying to figure out how we can have him go take a good power walk, <clears throat> go down to the nurse's office, and this particular student actually needs to do some wall push-ups or have some hand weights that he can do some exercise. I'm going to do universal design and what's good for everybody first. But I've got some students I know who need more input. And these are just some examples of all the things we were just talking about. Um, we're going to go on to visual processing. I think we've got a little bit of time. When you think about visual processing with some of our students, and really think beyond acuity, you've got to be able to think about visual, visual perception. You've got to be thinking about light, dark. Details, ocular motor, visual motor, all that spatial, um, visual discrimination, lots going on under the visual processing area. So we've got our kiddos who see very fine details and others that don't notice things that are the bigger picture. And we have others who are more um, difficulty reading nonverbal cues and difficulty seeing the big picture. If I kind of look through the world through a little pinhole and that's all I see when I walk in the room and I just don't take in all the visual cues that are happening then I'm going to miss a lot, right? And then on the flip side, I've seen some wonderful, amazing, we have some of the, in the exhibit hall of artists, and that they are just beautiful, make wonderful paintings because they are so incredibly detail-oriented. So it's not necessarily a, always a horrible thing, but just a challenge in different settings. 
And so some of that under-responsivity you may see is them not noticing those visual cues, responding to someone giving them a visual cue, responding to something in their environment they're supposed to pick up on, recognizing the sights and sounds and things that should be more familiar to them, sights rather. And then we've got kids who are visually craving. They want, they want more things. If you see some of your higher need kids, possibly in a life skills that are still doing some stimming in the side of their peripheral of their eyes. It's very, they really like that intense visual input. They like to see things spin. They like to see things more visually um, enticing. Some of the fast paced video action that goes on on the screen. I don't even know as we as teachers can keep up with what's on a video screen, how fast the picture changes. It bothers my visual sense as quickly as things happen. Um, and they have challenges with writing, reading, all of these areas. So visual processing difficulties can cause my difficulty with tracking, with colors and lights, depth perception, dis learning disabilities, difficulty reading those cues and seeing that big picture. And then this is just a quote, and there are several on your handouts. Read them when you get a chance. I think they're so telling. It feels like being trapped on a merry-go-round. All the lights, the sounds, they come and they go so quickly. You can't make sense of any of it. You're up and then you're down. No matter what, you can't get off and you have to wait for the ride to be over. And that's how the, many of the adults are describing the sensory overload. And we want our kids to be successful and they are really struggling. So let's talk a little bit more about that for a few minutes. All right, let's go to the eyes. Let's go to visual processing. One thing I wanted to start, start with that's kind of interesting, I just learned a few years ago. You know how the eyeballs have rods and cones in them? Remember that from health class a long time ago? Okay, the cones essentially are in the center. The rods are essentially on the edges. Okay, the cones are most sensitive to movement and light. The rods are less sensitive to that. All right, we tend to use the rods more for night vision and for looking through at the periphery. All right, when a student, I want you to think autism for a minute. Okay, when a student with autism, can I look at you and I won't get any closer. I'm gonna use this as my student. When a, no, you be the teacher, I'm gonna be the student. When a student with autism looks at you when you're talking to them, your face is moving. Look how many, my, every muscle in my face is moving when I'm talking with her. That actually is painful to that student. It really hurts to watch my face move. So this student sometimes will watch my face like this. If she's the teacher. What does it look like I'm doing to that teacher? Ignoring the teacher, exactly. Avoiding eye contact, ignoring the teacher. Actually. I'm avoiding pain. I'm watching her out of my peripheral vision because it hurts less. Isn't that interesting? So be sensitive to that. If you have a student on the spectrum who is avoiding eye contact continually, before you give directions, make sure you have that student's attention and then let them look away. Now, don't just start talking while they're looking away because you probably won't have their attention. So that's a two-part mm -hmm. thing. Get their attention and then let them look away. You will have a better chance of them understanding what you're saying. Did you want I to just wanted to add that we have many students who are mono-channeled, mono-sensory channeled. They can only do one at a time. You know, I can look at you, but now I'm totally not listening to anything you're saying. I may be visually distracted by your earring, your necklace, your mouth moving. Studies were done on individuals on the spectrum where that's what they were watching was the movement of the mouth. So now I can look down and now I can listen to you, but now I'm not looking at you. So I think again, we're so, as Kathy's saying, so quick to demand eye contact and we have to kind of, I'm not saying that we don't want to teach strategies on how to help them, but we have to be careful. Okay, let's go away from autism just into neurotypically developing kids. How do you know as a teacher that this student may have some difficulties with visual processing? There's probably not gonna be an IEP that says that. Okay, these students may skip lines and leave empty spaces on their worksheet. Any kids come to your mind as you're thinking of that? That's a clue that a student might have visual processing challenges. They may be the student who does poorly on a crowded worksheet. You know, the worksheet where you have a whole lot of tasks on the same sheet, or if they came, came from a workbook or something, it would probably have some kind of a picture or a graph there. That kind of worksheet is very difficult for our kids with visual processing challenges. If you suspect that one of your students is having challenges with that, maybe scan that worksheet and have them do that test 
on a computer. They can zoom it so there's less vis visible to them at a time. You, of course, could go to the copy machine and expand it and make the print bigger, but that's not as socially appropriate mm -hmm. for teenagers as it is to do their work at a computer. Um, another clue, a student may write over his own writing. Okay, think of handwriting. They might write over what they've already written. They may have trouble writing within the lines or the margin. A lot of our kids with visual processing challenges have a hard time copying from the board to their paper. So they just quit the task. And it looks like non-compliance, right? Looks like they're just not willing to write down their assignments. It may be visual processing. If you have a student who continually doesn't, won't, can't, put whatever word you want in there, write things down from the board to their assignment notebook, consider giving them pre-written notes. Consider giving it to them rather than continuing to demand a task that they're not succeeding at, whatever the reason is. It might be visual processing challenges. What can I do about it in the classroom? How can I make that easier? One thing, watch for bleed through, especially if your kids are reading paperback books. Bleed through is where the print from the back side of the page kind of shows through the page. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, for kids with visual processing challenges, sometimes those two levels of print intermingle and it becomes kind of a blur. It's very difficult for kids to discriminate what's for and what's back. So if you have a child that's having trouble reading one of your books, look at it. If you can see bleed through, try, it's an easy experiment, take it to the copy machine and copy this page and then copy this page and see if the student does better. It's a good clue and it's an easy, easy way to fix that. Um, there, is a, there is an app, an iPad app that we talked about in our technology thing called SnapType. Has anybody heard of SnapType? It's really my favorite iPad app. Mm -hmm. And what you do with it is, and it's free, it's free. You take a picture of a worksheet, and then where you tap on the worksheet, the student can type their answer to a test. You can expand it, make it bigger. They don't have to deal with a whole worksheet. Give it a look. The, the free version, you can do that, but you can't save. You can go ahead and have them take their test, and they can send it to you, email it to you. The version that's like $2, you can save all their files so you have their academic history on the iPad. Put that in, take a look at that one, SnapType, if you have a student that you think might benefit from that. Um, provide a copy of class notes. We all know that this is a help for students who have trouble with visual processing. Highlight the important text or keywords. Do it in a socially sensitive way because it's not as appropriate for a high school student to have the teacher putting yellow marks on his paper as it is in an elementary school. So be discreet and be sensitive, sensitive to the mm -hmm. fact that peer reaction is very important. Um, I wanted to add just because you're on that part about the highlighting the important text. And if we can also teach our students to do that themselves. I know there's sometimes they're not going to know what was the most important and they need help. But if they go through and you've got a worksheet or some kind of a, a something they've got to have a written response on, and they go through and look, just look for the dark lines, that's all they're doing, and they put a yellow highlighter, they're learning how to use a strategy themselves, and they can use it later during testing, during whatever. But many of our kids will skip lines. That's on actually on one of the uh, sensory evaluation questions is, does he skip answers even though you know he knew the answer and a lot of times they just didn't visually tune in to that answer and their eyes went down to another area and just skipped over it so for whatever reason that we can help them to learn the strategies as well that this will they can go with in life well, were any of you at our technology presentation earlier today okay look on the flash drive and all the handouts from that presentation are on the flash drive there are many many technology tools that will help kids with these sensory challenges. Visual processing, auditory processing, uh, not proprioception, but there are many, many tools on there that will help the kids. Take a look and see if there's anything on there that you might want to try with your kids. M most of them are oriented toward middle school and high school, so they'd be appropriate for your audiences. Mm -hmm. um, I know we're pretty much out of time. Does anybody have a question that you would like or a comment that you'd like to share? Mm -hmm. 
Um, I just wanted to point out, and I, we've got like a minute and a half left, so there's so many areas sensory-wise, so I'm sorry that we couldn't get to everything, so hopefully you've had some thinking time and some connections you can make and some strategies you can think, take back. We can answer any questions. We'll stay for a little bit if you have. I just want to, in closing, point out interoception, though, to you, because you'll have students who their internal senses, their organs, the bladder, bowel, heart, lungs, um, all of that, even sexual arousal areas, our emotions are my internal sensory interoceptors, that they can get faulty information. So you can have kiddos who are under-responsive and over-responsive and not getting the right discriminatory information. So you have a kiddo who thinks that maybe he's really hungry, but he wasn't hungry. Maybe he really had a stomach ache, but the information is faulty. Uh, you can have a kiddo who doesn't understand why his heart is beating so fast and his, he's a little out of breath of what connecting what caused that, what was the emotion, what triggered that response. Um, trying to be able for kids who have problems that always need to go to the bathroom that may not get the sensation until their bladder is really, really, really full and then they're in rush mode versus other ones who are, and I'm sorry, that was the opposite. The nurse, the, going to the nurses a lot, I feel like I have to go all the time. So they, every little bit of urine, they feel the sensation and they need to go to the restroom more frequently. So you can see the point is just that there's some faulty information going on. And so look at those internal triggers that might be there that look, again, behaviorish when possible. And I think it's almost always possible. Have some kind of communication, whatever that looks like with that particular student, and see if you can do detective work together to find out what strategies. And having students to take time to have mindfulness, to teach your teenagers deep breathing, calming strategies, being able to be in the moment long enough and present just to relax and to listen to their heartbeat, to their breathing, and then to be able to use that as a strategy when I am feeling stress and anxiety so that learning and all those good things can happen. So I wish we had more time. You guys were a great audience, but thanks for sticking